again today as we're continuing our series. We took a break last week to celebrate our 10th birthday. Whoop, whoop. And, um, and I want to continue talking through these churches that we see here that Jesus writes to his churches through the apostle John onto the eldership or the leadership of the churches there. And this week we're focusing on the church of Tharatara. Everybody say Tharatara. Uh, we're probably saying that right, Thyatira. And Thyatira is, again, just one of these seven churches, and we've been digging into all of them a little bit. Let me share just a little bit about Thyatira. Now, Thyatira is a, a manufacturing city, and in, in this city, they are producing a lot of wool and a lot of fabric, and one of their industries is, is coloring clothing and fabric. And in fact, you can read about this woman in Acts chapter 16. Her name's Lydia. She's actually from Thyatira, and she she actually has purple cloth, which, you know, purple is royalty, and I love that. And it says that she opened up her home, and you can see that she's a, a disciple of Paul, and she opens up her home to the disciples. And I, I just, I, I love that royalty does that, right? Royalty doesn't say, you know, royalty doesn't say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm big and I'm awesome. No, royalty serves. And that's one thing that we're learning in the kingdom that we, that we serve like kings, right? We, we, we think, oh, the king, kingly, that just means you want everybody to serve you. No, no, no. We serve like kings and we rule like servants. And so I love that, that this woman, Lydia, is mentioned here and that she's connected with this city of Tharatara. And, and in this city, like many of the cities that we've talked about, they had these like unions or these guilds of workers because it was a, because it was a laboring town. It was a manufacturing city. So what would happen is kind of like today, not so much in modern eras, but in recent eras, you would have unions. And in order to be good at business and run a business or be successful at a business or be, be employed by a business, you had to be a part of these unions, now, the problem was with these unions for Christians, there was a little bit of tension because in order to be a part of these unions, they, they would actually sanction these feasts, these parties that you had to go to. But they weren't just like you show up, you know, and kind of shake hands and work the room and leave. They actually would worship idols at these feasts. So what was happening is everybody was invited and not only were they worshiping idols by sacrificing food and eating food that is sacrificed to these idols, they were actually involving themselves as worship unto these idols, sexual immorality. So there are orgies and all this kind of crazy, gross sexual behavior happening at these events as worship to these false gods. So Christians had to deal with this persecution. A lot of the persecution that we've been talking about, a lot of the persecution they're dealing with right here is they're dealing with, do, do I go to the feast? Do I even show up? Because I know what my eyes are gonna see. I know what's gonna appeal to my flesh. And so what you had is you had people showing up, believers showing up to these festivals, and they would be like, well, God sees my heart. I'll just go ahead and eat some of this fruit. Well, God sees my heart. He knows that I'm really, he knows that my devotion is to him, but I'll just, you know, I, I've got to provide for my, my family. And how many times do we justify participating in what the world's doing and not trust the Lord in his provision and just kind of do things on our own and say, you know what, I'll, I'll just participate a little bit. The Lord knows my heart. He does know your heart. And is your heart to trust him as a provider? So this is what the church is dealing with. I'm not going to read the, in, the entire letter We're gonna, and then go back to it. I'm just going to read through it as we go because it is the longest letter that we have uh, in these first couple chapters of Revelation. So as every letter, it starts off with Jesus, right? Jesus giving a revelation of who he is. Remember, it's the revelation of Jesus, right? Revel it's not the revelations of the Antichrist or the end time. It's the revelation of Jesus. And so every letter, he's like, let me show you who I am. And he starts off to Tharatara saying this, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. So Jesus is laying the framework of what he's about to tell them. And he starts off saying this, I'm the Son of God. Don't forget that I'm sovereign. 
Don't forget that I am the beginning and the end. Don't forget that I am God in the flesh. I am an absolute authority. I have the final word. Do not forget that I'm sovereign and powerful. I am the son of God. See, a lot of people tend to forget that. Oh, we just like Jesus. He's just my homeboy. He's not your homeboy. He's the, he's the sovereign king, ruler of the universe. He's, the, he's not just the son of man. He's the son of God. 100% son of man, 100% son of God. He's God in the flesh. Any theology that eliminates Jesus as not being God, that's not the Jesus that we serve. That's a fake Jesus. Any, any, anyone that denies that Jesus is the son of God, uh, 1 John actually tells us this, that that's a spirit of antichrist. And there's a lot of people out there that are claiming Jesus, but he's not the Jesus that we speak of in the scriptures. And then it says this about him, that he has eyes of fire. Now these, these eyes speak of the, of, of the fire of grace, but also the fires of judgment. We don't like talking about judgment, right? In fact, we've got campaigns about not judging. Now, now let, me, let me deal with this real quick. There's a difference between judgment and condemnation. You make judgments every day. Today you woke up and you made a judgment on what you were going to wear to church. You made a judgment on whether you're going to take a left turn or a right turn. You've made judgments today. Condemnation is whenever you, are, you mistreat someone according to their actions. Do we understand? Mistreat. Okay? But listen, he has eyes of fire. What does that mean? Well, it means that he is filled with passion and intentionality. See, he sees all. He sees every yes. He sees every selfless behavior as well as every selfish one. He sees every intention of the human heart. Only the Lord can look deep down into your heart and know what you're feeling, know what you're thinking, know what your motivation is. Every good motivation, every bad motivation. The fire of his eyes illuminate everything. He sees everything. He's passionate in desire for those that are his beloved, and he has severe intensity for what he is against. Do not forget the severity of the Lord. There are things that Jesus is against. Let us not forget, as we navigate in this culture, don't forget that Jesus hates these feasts. Jesus hates the immorality. Jesus hates the idolatry. He hates it intensely, not with closed eyes, but with eyes of intensity, eyes of fiery affection. Hebrews chapter 413 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. Everything is uncovered and lay bared before the eyes of whom we must give account. We will all stand before Jesus one day. And he's going to know every intention. He's going to have, that's why Jesus is like, it's not just about, it's not just about um, murdering people. It's actually about having hate in your heart. It's not just about committing adultery with another woman. It's about the lust that you have in your heart. So Jesus, Jesus is saying, I see deep down, I see beyond your actions. And you will give account for that. It's the severity of the Lord. It's scary. Oh, is he mad? He's not mad, but he's serious. He's serious about this. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. So he sees it all. Listen, he doesn't, sometimes we have this kind of grid for Jesus that we're like, oh, he just, the Lord sees my heart. Yes, sometimes that's scary. I don't know about you, but I'm never 100% properly motivated. Am I the only one? And maybe, maybe you are. Maybe your intentions are always pure. Mine are not always. And he sees that. And I want him to see it, and I want him to call it out. Because, listen, he knows what you don't even know about you. So it's good for you to get before the Lord whenever you're behaving or misbehaving. To go, Lord, why do I do that? Ask the Lord. Don't justify it. Don't go, oh, Lord, it's just the way I am. Okay, it is just the way you are. Why are you that way? Why are you the way that you are? I need a little office reference there. Y'all missed it. Why are you the way that you are? Ask the Lord. Lord, why am I that way? Why do I do that? Why do? And, he starts, and then he starts going, well, remember when you were like eight years old? And that teacher was on your case every day for six months. Do you remember that? Yeah, that's why you act like that. Let me heal that. He sees, he, listen, he sees what you don't see. He's got, he's got the illumination from heaven. 
And then it says this, he has feet like burnished bronze. Again, what this is, we, we talked about this. This is speaking of, of, of walking through judgment. Jesus is, is, bronze represents like metal. This glowing bronze represents metal that has been purified in the fire. The fires of judgment. That's what a fire is, right? A fire, if you, if you, if you bring in impurities into a fire, what happens to the impurities? If, you, if someone brings you a chunk of gold and it's got, it's all black and stuff, and it's not just gold, they will burn that gold in a fire, a refiner's fire. They'll burn that gold until all the stuff that's not gold separates from the gold. And all you have is gold. This is what the judgments of the Lord do. They refine us. And so many of us are, are, are proof texting the judgment of God out of our life. Listen, the judgment of God be begins at the house of the Lord. Do you understand this? They're good. They're right. They're pure. And I think sometimes we think the judgments of God are bad, but they're not. They're, po they're pointed at everything in your life that hinders you from loving Jesus well. That's what they're pointed at. And he is fiery, and he's affectionate about those things. Oh, yeah, well, only God will judge me. Yeah. You should be incredibly careful. Because most people that say that live really loose. That is, that, that is the most, only God, well, not only God. People are going to criticize you. People are going to condemn you. But you will stand before God. A God that is severely against sin. We will stand before him. And it's good for us to hold this in the tension of our heart to say, God, you are, you are deeply against sin. You are deeply against the activities. You're not against me, but the activities that violate our covenant. Listen, I severely love my wife. If a man approaches her, he will see the severity of Josh Brown. Because there's nothing gonna, that it's going to stand. And my, my severity is little and small compared to his. And if we are the bride of Christ, then we need to welcome the severity of the Lord. The judgment of the Lord to say, Lord, come in and get rid of every other lover that would try to distract me. This needs to be the position of our heart. We belong to him. We're his. We're his beloved. So he says this to the church. He says, I know your deeds. So he sees us. He's, he's judging and he starts talking about their deeds. He's like, I know your deeds. And he's like excited about it. Your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance. I know that you're doing now more than you did at first. So you remember the, the, the church in Ephesians? He was like, you, you're slacking it, right? You started off well, and now you're like far. He's, this church is actually increasing in good works. He's like, your deeds, you're, you're doing good ministry. You're doing outreach. You got humanitarian works. Today, you would be out feeding the homeless. You'd be ministering to orphans. You'd be ministering to, to the widows. You'd be doing all the good deeds. Do you have deep love for people? You're at all the rallies. You're at all the things. You're, you, your humanitarian efforts are impeccable. Your faith, oh, your faith is so strong. It's proven by your works. Look at your works. We had a, we had a woman, I think it was Monday, we were at Sam's Club, and uh, there was a, a woman who was a little bit more seasoned in years, and she was in a, I believe she was in one of those motorized carts, and she's moving her stuff. I don't remember if she's in a regular cart or a motorized cart, but she's moving in one cart to another cart, and, and she's this woman that's, you know, she has some years on her, and there's, like, employees, like, standing around, and people are standing around, so I'm like, let me help you, so I start helping you, and she, and not a big deal, it's just, it's just what we do, and, and this, this, she says to me, she says, well, you've done your good deed of the day, and I thought, my good deed of the day, is that all, is that, I looked at Leslie, I said, is that all it takes, just one a day, is, is that all we need, is just one good deed a day, so this church, they were living like this, they were living graciously, they were, they were helping people out, they were bending over backwards to help people, they, they were persevering, they were enduring, they were enduring difficulty, they had a, a spirit of excellence, we talk about excellence. Excell what is excellence? Excellence is not perfection. Excellence is your best in progress. And here they were. They had their best in progress. They were getting better and better and better. They were doing so good. And Jesus is affirming them. He said, yeah, come on. And then the rest of the email, right? 
The rest of the text, I love you so much. You're doing so good. However, I have to send those sometimes. It's near fun. Yeah. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Oh, Lord. You tolerate. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Now, we, we talk about Jezebel. If you've grown up or if you've been around charismatic circles for the last, you know, 30 years, you've probably heard people use that term a lot, right? The spirit of Jezebel. What is Jezebel? What is the spirit of Jezebel? Well, let me help you today. Well, and it says this, that she calls herself a prophet, prophetess. First of all, always be weary of anyone who calls himself a prophet or a prophetess or an apostle or an apostle. Just... Anytime someone leads with their title, <laughs> be skeptical. It's okay. It's okay to be skeptical. It's good for you. Some of you need to be more skeptical. Some of you need to be less. Yeah. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. So what is she doing? She's leading my servants, my people, my beloved, she's leading them into sexual immorality and eating the food sacrificed to idols, what we were talking about a moment ago. Again, we see it. Sexual immorality, idolatry, always playing together. Similar to what we've been seeing. Again, these festivals, she's going, and she's misleading God's people. Hey, go ahead. Come on. You need to, you, you need to come to the feast with me. Meet me over at the feast. Would you come on? Come on over. Nobody has to know about it. The Lord knows your heart. Would you come over? Come on. How are you going to provide for your family? How are you going to provide for your family if you don't come to the feast? So they'll exile you from the guild, and you, you won't be able to have your business anymore. Come on, play along. She's misleading the prophets. And it says this, she's using two things. She's using idolatry, and she's using sexual immorality. And some people, this is what we do, is we say, well, I'm not guilty of idolatry. <laughs> Come on. I don't have, like, any statues in my house, right? I don't have, I have any little candles that I go and pray to or pictures or images or anything like that. I, I, I'm not an idolater. Listen, idolatry is just simply prioritizing anything over the lordship of Jesus. Anything in your life that has more influence than him is idolatry. Mike Bickle says idolatry is seeking to have power outside of the will of God. That's idolatry. And then he goes on and he says, this, I've given her time to repent of her immorality. So he's like, I've been gracious to her. But she's not responding to my grace. She's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. Whoa. Jesus, Jesus, I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Those that participate in her pagan ways will also suffer. Those that participate in the pleasure, they will also participate in the suffering unless they repent. It's interesting. It says here, repent of her ways. Her influence. He says this, I will strike her children dead. Now, I don't believe that the Lord is going to strike literal children dead, but the disciples of this activity that's happening, those that are following, her followers. Again, the judgment of the Lord is, is, is pointed at her for his church, for his people. This is the fruit of her ministry, her disciples, her followers. And then he says this in verse 23. He says, the churches will know. The other churches are going to know that I am he who searches, here it is again, hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. So he's saying, I really do see. I am the son of God. I have eyes of fire, and I see. I see it all. And I've got a big problem with you, church. You tolerate this activity. He doesn't even rebuke them for participating. It's a rebuke of toleration. Listen, you don't allow this woman in your house. If she's in your house, you throw her out. 
Do you get this? You don't tolerate. You don't allow. That is not welcome here. Those TV programs aren't welcome here. Those apps aren't welcome here. That behavior is not welcome here. You need, listen, beloved, it's time that we get a little firm. We've been gracious and kind and tolerant and all this kind of stuff. And we've, we've treated that like it's virtuous. It's not. It's not virtuous to permit evil. So how do we recognize Jezebel? Well, first of all, what Jezebel is not. Jezebel is not a gifted or strong woman. She's got a microphone. She must have a spirit of Jezebel. We think that's funny. People actually preach that. She's a woman in leadership. She's strong. She's a Jezebel. That's not a Jezebel. That statement is made from insecure, bigoted men. That's who makes those statements. Or insecure, bigoted women, because women can say those kind of things too. By the way, Jezebel isn't a spirit that's just on women. It's also on men. I've seen it. In fact, I've seen it more on men than I have on women. So don't, so, don't, so don't start throwing labels because you feel something. You better have some evidence. If you're going to bring accusation, then make sure that it's true. Because last I checked, false testimony <laughs> is one of the Ten Commandments. So who is Jezebel, right? Other than, oh, I heard about her, right? <laughs> oh, that woman. <laughs> I remember that woman. The pastor told me he exiled her from the church. And when I said, what happened to that woman? He said, well, she was a Jezebel. So that's who you have in your, she might have been, she might not have been, I don't know. But I I will tell you this, if she was and she was exiled, good on him. Or good on her for calling that out. Because I I would do the same. If there's a Jezebel here, you're going to have to find somewhere else to go to church. Bye, see ya. Because I'm not going to allow her to seduce the men in this house, the women in this house, the people in this house. Whether it's a man or a woman, you come in here with all that, sexual swag, trying to lure somebody in, you're going you're gonna to leave. And if we have to take care of it physically, we will. I won't do it, but somebody will. <laughs> I've got some, got some big people with me that have equipment, the equipment necessary to do those kind of things. All right. So who is Jezebel? So Jezebel is the daughter of, a, of, of a, this king of the Sidonians, which was a, 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 a pagan nation that worshiped this God named Baal, okay? And so what happens is she marries the king of Israel, Ahab. Bad news, Ahab, Ahab what are you doing? And, and she was involved in witchcraft. It tells us in 2 Kings chapter 9. She's involved in the occult, all this kind of stuff. She has... Um, eunuchs around her, which are basically male concubines all the time. I mean, she's, she's very alluring, very sexual. And so Ahab marries her, and then as soon as he marries her, Baal worship begins to be instituted in the nation of Israel. And so you have all these Jewish people worshiping Baal. They're like, oh, we worship Jesus. We're taking the Sabbath. We worship. They don't say Jesus because the Messiah hadn't come yet, but they were like, we're, worship, we're worshiping Yahweh. We're worshiping the Lord. And the whole time, they're over here worshiping these idols. And the whole time, they're messing around sexually as worship to these idols, and they're thinking that they can handle both worlds. And so what she started doing is the prophets of God started speaking up about what was, they're like, this isn't right. You need to stop worshiping. So she starts killing God's prophets. Having them killed. She's now queen. She's in charge. And she's got this leadership role. She's manipulating the people that can be manipulated. And she's killing the people that she can't. And she has a reputation for this. So Elijah is, has this famous battle on Mount Carmel, where, he, where God proves himself by fire. It's a beautiful story. It's in 2 Kings chapter 18, 19. And what happens is he has this huge 
party, right? The, the glory of the Lord falls down in fire, burns up the sacrifices that have been saturated in water. All the people are freaking out. All these people are getting converted. And then he has 450 prophets of Baal killed. I mean, it's like, it's, it's time for God's people to rise up, and they do. And so he has this big victory, and then Jezebel says, I'm going to take care of you. And so Elijah, who just has this victory, runs off into hiding in isolation and discouragement and tells the Lord, I wish my life would end. There's nobody else. And God's like, I have other prophets. They're set aside for me. They're reserved. Why are you so discouraged? And he's just like, I'm so afraid of this woman. He prays that God would take him. So how do we recognize this is, this is the, the grid? This is what the spirit of Jezebel that was on her, I believe, in this church. I don't believe it was a woman named Jezebel. I think it's Jezebel is like a label for a person and their activities. We still use it today some. I'm not sure that we always use it properly, but we use it. So what does it look like? Well, first of all, it looks like manipulation. This is what it says. She misleads Manipulation now, it doesn't mean that every person's a manipulator is a Jezebel, but her manipulation is specific through appeal to sexual appetite and covetousness. Covetousness could also be considered greed. I want more. I need more. I need more. So manipulation through these forms. So that's one way that you recognize. Another way is through dis- through someone who despises and dismissive and is dismissive of the word of God. This was, listen, this was her agenda. Get rid of the word of the Lord. And we've got, listen, I believe it right now in 2022 that the spirit of Jezebel is heavy in the American church. I believe that there are churches with all this like affirming nonsense that we're getting into with all the garbage of, of allowing all the sexual immorality be permitted, calling it love, calling it whatever, just allowing this to come in. And, and, and you know what ends up happening when that happens? They say, oh, the Bible is not really that important. It's just all about love. Love, love, love. Right? Oh, the, just be love, loving. Just be loving. Yeah, just, just be loving of the person that comes in and sexually assaults your wife. Just be loving of that person. I, I, no, sir. The m- most loving thing for me to do is take that person out of the equation. Yeah, whatever means necessary. <laughs> A manipulation of the word of God. Oh, that, you know, the times have changed. Get on with the program. Come on. Replacing a cross for a rainbow flag. There are churches in our area that, that have that banner on their church. Manipulation of the word of God. Another is this, a promotion of, of idolatry. Again, not figurines and statues. Greed, covetousness, discontentment, all these things can be classified into idolatry. Another one is making light of sexual purity. Now listen, if you've sinned sexually, repent. And don't be shameful. Get before the Lord. Get in a healthy relationship. We can deal with that. But we don't justify it. Come on, we don't justify sexual purity. And now purity has become a bad word. Oh, purity culture. (laughs) What do you want? You want the opposite? You want adultery culture? You want fornication culture? Is that what you want? We want grace culture, but grace empowers us to say no to ungodliness. And so, again, tenderly speaking the truth, stirring up discouragement rooted in fear. This is another thing about Jezebel. So he continues with this rebuke. Again, it's not a rebuke of those who participate, but for those that tolerate. So in their kindness, and a lot of this is going to fit right now in 2022, right? In their kindness and tenderness, they allowed Jezebel to infiltrate their ranks, leading the people of God through seduction and teaching. 
Listen, we cannot afford to to the tolerance of wickedness and label it kindness. Tolerance is not kind. Tolerance is not a virtue when you're tolerating evil. So stop letting the culture, beloved, listen, the world has been telling the church long enough on what we should believe. I am, listen, I am not defined, I do not define my morality by someone that doesn't belong to Jesus. I identify my morality and what is right and what is true based upon the word of God, not on what culture accepts or rejects or hates or it's turned off by. It's the word of God. And Jezebel will do everything she can to minimize the word of God, to discredit the word of God, to talk about how it's irrelevant. So, listen, we, so culture is demanding that, that we conform, right? Oh, just conform and call it unity. You think it's unity when you disagree with someone and you're sitting in the room with them with your mouth shut? That's not unity. You listen, unity without the truth being at the center is a lie. It's, it, 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 that's called conformity. And unity and conformity are not the same thing. This is what the world is demanding of us. Unity is only virtuous when it's gathered around the truth. I love what Warren Wearsby says. He says, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. Beloved, ignoring or overlooking sin is not kind. It's cruel. Don't overlook the sin in your kids. Don't overlook the sin in your spouse. Don't look, overlook the sin in your brothers and sisters that are in the room with you that you're doing life with. Don't wink at it. It's a big deal to God. It's not okay. Then that's what we say. Man, I've sinned. Someone confesses, it's okay. It's not okay. It can be covered. It can, it, we can get before the Lord with it, and I hope you do. Because when I, listen, when I sin, I need to go somebody with that sin, with that sin because I want to get free of it. Not because I want them to tell me, oh, it's okay. Just go ahead and keep doing it. And this is what we do. It's okay. Not a big deal. It's not okay. Jesus is gracious. And this is what he tells her. He's like, I've been giving you time to repent, but you haven't responded. Listen, I believe we are in an hour right now that the Lord is looking at his church and he's going, how much longer? How much longer? How much longer are you going to keep looking at those inappropriate images? How much longer are you going to continue with those inappropriate text messages? How much longer? He's giving you time. You better seize the time because that time won't last forever. And this is exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> I know this is the severity of the Lord, but his grace is saying, I, have, I haven't taken you out yet. I haven't taken you out yet. Therefore, repent. Because yeah, right. this is the thing. This is the thing with sexual sin. Sexual sin, whatever we tolerate, dominates. And so what happens is we just kind of put up with, oh, it's not really a big of a deal. I didn't look for very long. I just kind of scrolled past it and then kind of scrolled back up. The next thing you know, you're hooked. Yeah. I just text her, just, hey, you look nice today. The next thing is, hey, you want to meet up? You okay? Yep. Sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality, according to the scriptures, is any sexual activity outside of a husband and wife. There it is. There's the definition. This is Jesus' definition. This is a definition all throughout the scripture. It didn't change. God's design for sex. Sex is good. He created it. He likes it. And he meant it to be enjoyed in the context of husband and wife. Not polluted. Not perverted. But in the purity of a husband and a wife, a thing that only they share. And it's beautiful and it's glorious. First Corinthians 6, 18, flee, not stand against, flee sexual immorality. I'm solid. I'm a, come on, devil. No, don't do that. I know you're 18 and you just came to the Lord, but you don't need, you don't need, you don't need that. You don't need to stand against that. You need to run. That's what Joseph did, right? He ran. Potiphar's wife's like, hey, come on. He's like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm out of here. Peace. I've had some moments where I've ran. (laughs) All other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever's, well, I thought all sin was the same. 
All other sins a person commits are outside of his body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. You're sinning against yourself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, I don't want to go into it, but he says this, he's like, anyone who claims to be a brother and sister who's, who's indulging in sexual immorality don't have anything to do with them. So what happens in the body of Christ when we know a brother or sister in the Lord is committing sexual immorality? We confront them. In loving and tenderly, not being angry, not being ugly about it, I say, man, listen, God has more for you than that. Why are you, oh, man, I don't know. And don't tell them it's okay. So what steps are you making to repent of that? And if they continually do it, peace out. It's the scriptures. It's the loving thing to do. In fact, he even goes so far to say in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 13, he says, expel the immoral among you. And really what he's talking about is predators that are in the midst. And that, that's what I was talking about earlier. We will use that scripture if that ever happens, by the way. We're trying to use them all, right? We're trying to use all the scriptures. We're trying to use them all. All right. So he, he continues with the reward. All right. Do y'all, do y'all see this? We, there, is a, there is a spirit on the loose today. The spirit of Jezebel is on the loose. It's in the church. It's in the world. Some of you, it's on your iPhone. Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. I'd say, cut off your cell service. <laughs> like, get you a flip phone. Whatever means necessary. I, I'm serious. Guard and protect that heart that the Lord has given you. Guard your purity at all costs, beloved. Maybe you've made mistakes. I'm telling you, there's a reward to those that will, that will steward well the opposition that comes. Those that, those that will rule and reign over fornication and adultery and immorality and idolatry. There's a reward coming if you can rule over those things and stop letting them rule you. And this is what he says. Now I'll say to the rest of you, Thyatira, to those of you who hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden to you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. So he's like, listen, just, just focus on this right now. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes and does the will of, does my will to the end, I will give authority, get this, over nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like uh, uh, pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, if you will steward well, if you will rule well in this life, you will rule in the next See, going to heaven, listen, we're not just going to heaven to float around like little angels and have, and have harps and sit on clouds and hang out in our gold mansions and walking down our gold streets. Honestly, that sounds a little boring after about a year or two. No, 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 no. We will be locked in endless fascination with our glorious bridegroom king, and we will rule and reign with him in resurrected bodies on a renewed earth for a thousand years. This is throughout the book of Revelation. What you rule now is sowing seeds for what you will rule later. What are you taking dominion over this this struggle? See, with his eyes of fire, he is seeing how we rule. How we rule in the area of self-discipline. How well we steward our heart, our time, our purity, our relationships. Whatever our hand is set to do, he sees how well we steward it. He sees how much immorality we tolerate in our own lives. How we steward whatever is in our hand in this age, and it will determine what we steward in the age to come. There's a parable in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. He says, if we're faithful with a little. And I know that we made this about a lot of things. Listen, I believe it's also speaking of the end of the age. If we are faithful over little, if I will rule over well whatever God has put in my hand, I'll be ruler over much in that day. So, beloved, take dominion. Rule over those things. Stop allowing the spirit of Jezebel. Stop allowing sexual immorality to control your life. Rule over that, and you will rule in the age to come. Then he, then he, then he gives this, this, this second gift. He says this, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. What is that, the morning star? Some have said that it's, 
the planet Venus because you can see it before the sun comes up. It's the brightest star in the, in the sky. I don't know if that's true or not. But Jesus is saying, I am the brightness. I am the brightest one in the darkness. It speaks of increased revelation of Jesus. What is the reward? What is the reward, Lord, if I, if I resist? What is the reward? I'm the reward. I'm the reward. I'm the one that you get to be locked in endless fascination with. I'm the one that you get to rule and reign with. I'm the one. I'm the morning star. I'm the brightest star. It's the, before the dawn comes, before, the, before I'm the, the sun that, that, that powers the planets. Because this is what's going to happen. That was crazy. Before any of that happens, I'll be the one. I'll be the one. It speaks of his power and his, his royalty. It outshines all the others. He says in Revelation twenty two sixteen. he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright morning star. I am the light in the darkness. I love, and we're closing with this. Listen, John chapter 1 says it this way. In verse 4, he says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. His light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Will you stand with me this morning? Listen, I, I believe the Lord today wants to shine. I think he wants to bring a revelation of that bright morning star For some of you, you might be in a, in a dark time, a dark season. The Lord's saying, I will be your light. See, it's that star that gives us hope that the sun's gonna come up. Hope's coming. Hope is coming. Hope is here. And a greater hope is coming. A greater revelation is coming. Listen, to, I believe that the Lord is putting in us a hearty no. Listen, if this is something that you've been struggling with, I, we are not here to condemn you. Most of us in this room have had, have had to kill our own Jezebel. And Elijah prophesied that she would, she would be eaten by dogs, and that's exactly what happens. Some of you need to, need to prophesy with a hearty no right now, no longer. My life is in the light of men. My life is in the bright morning star. My life is in him. Jesus is my source. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my fulfillment. Jesus is my security. Jesus is my safety. Jesus is my refuge. Jesus is the protector of my heart. Jesus is the forgiver of my sins. Jesus is the healer of my diseases. Jesus brings hope to the darkest night. Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you are encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.